This is a ramping up your English book review. An atlas is a collection of maps. A historic atlas is a collection of maps, photos, and illustrations that tells the reader about what happened in the past and where things happened. For the reader learning about the history of railroads, I recommend National Geographic's Historical Atlas of the United States. Many aspects of American history are beautifully illustrated here, organized around themes like immigration and industrialization. Railroad history is included here with simple yet poignant maps illustrating the expansion and then the decline of railroads in the United States through time. Readers can see the expanding effects of the transcontinental railroad and the erasing of many railroads after World War II when automobiles, trucks, and airlines sapped away business from many of the railroads of the time. The atlas also contains regional maps of the United States. If you want to see graphic illustrations of railroad history, get your hands on a copy of National Geographic's Historical Atlas of the United States. You can probably find one at your local library. For Ramping Up Your English, I'm John Letts. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English. This is episode three, segment two. This is a good time to ask yourself how much of the previous video clip you understood. Was it 100%, 50%, none at all? Whatever it is, go ahead and record that in your notebook. Write in the estimated percent and add episode three and the date. We'll compare that with later video clips. Speaking of your notebook, let's quickly take a look at what would be there if you'd been with us since episode one. So let's take a look here. We have some things that were written down from the first episode. It's a log of what you understood about how much. Some vocabulary work we did in the first episode. And then we had some sentence construction using the word consists of in terms of, um, of uh, description, and some more precise ways of doing things. You can find these on our website. Go to letscreate.org. Follow the links to episodes one and two. If you'd rather not catch up, you'll still benefit by starting a fresh notebook. During our first episode, I referred to a children's dictionary, which I recommended for looking up unknown words. Unfortunately, I failed to show it, so here it is. This dictionary is comprehensive enough to contain most words you'll encounter in this unit, yet it's basic enough to help you understand the meaning. The dictionary you use depends on your level of proficiency and your age. During our second episode, we ramped up some sentences about the function of train yards. We started with these sentences, typical of inner Immediate level English learners. We saw an equal number of sentences ramped up to a higher level. The first sentence introduced the topic, followed by a compound sentence and another sentence showing a supporting detail. Our homework then was to write sentences about the functions of these objects in the kitchen. And so this is what we ended up with our homework. Of course, the sentences you wrote will be unique. These are examples of what early intermediate English learners would be able to write. A stove cooks food, a sink is where you can get water and wash dishes, cabinets are where you can keep food until you're ready to use it. All of these are perfectly correct sentences. They clearly state the functions of the objects in the kitchen. Now let's ramp them up like we did with the sentences about train yards. A kitchen contains a number of features that facilitate preparing food. A stove provides heat for cooking, while a sink is a source of water for cooking and cleaning. Cabinets supply storage space for food until it's ready to be prepared. The first sentence introduces the topic without a supporting detail. The second sentence is a compound sentence, providing two supporting details. And the third sentence adds another supporting detail. There's a certain rhythm to these sentence groups a rhythm you'll likely pick up as we do these in future programs. They create a certain flow of the language that hints at fluency. These sentences are no more correct than the first example, but they communicate at a higher level of proficiency. 
See if you can do the same with sentences you wrote for homework. In segment one of today's show, we watched a video clip of early railroads, including construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. If you missed the clip, you can watch it by going to letscreate.org. In our first two episodes, we started building a bank of words we hear often in the video clips we watch. Most of them so far have been the names of things, what we call nouns in English. I suggest you continue this practice all through the unit. Write down important words and attempt to find their meanings. Today, we're focusing on action words, which we call verbs in English. A video about early railroads was packed with actions that took place in the past, so it's a good time to take a look at past tense verbs. So this is our learning objective today, to use past tense verbs to relate events in the past. Here are a few action words right from the video clip. Take a look at these. Bless, flock, invest, pull, control, call, and establish. All of these verbs form the past tense by a method you probably already know as an intermediate English language learner. You simply add ed to the end of the word. If the word already ends in e, you add a d and there you go. You've changed a present verb into a past tense verb. Be careful about pronouncing some of these. The ending sounds of blessed, flocked is pronounced more like a T than a D. Pulled, controlled, called, and established all end with more of a D sound without adding a syllable to the word. Of this list, only invested is pronounced with the ED as an added syllable. Early intermediate English learners often add the ed, the ed, as an extra syllable to the wrong word. That is a mistake worth celebrating because it shows that you can apply the main rule for turning verbs into past tense, but it's a stage that needs to be passed through and left behind at some point. You have probably discovered by now that English often breaks its own rules. Like many other languages in English, some of the most often used verbs form the past tense in other ways. Let's look at these present tense verbs that were used in the past tense in the video clip. Begin, build, make, set, have, are, and come. People in the early stages of learning English will treat these like regular verbs, but they soon notice that they don't sound right. Begin, make, setted, these are all errors I've heard when teaching English. Let's take a look at the correct way to make these verbs in the past tense. Begin becomes began, build becomes built, make becomes made, set remains a set, have becomes had, are becomes were, and come becomes came. Having English conversations, watching our videos, and reading are some of the great ways to become aware of how irregular verbs change to become past tense verbs. You can also go to our website for a list of common irregular verbs. Go to letscreate.org. You'll also find a link in episode 3 to an extended list of irregular verbs. You may even see a list in the dictionary you're using. There are just a few of the many irregular verbs to be aware of. We'll introduce more in later programs. This ends segment two of episode three of Ramping Up Your English. You can watch or download this episode and previous ones by going to archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. I'll be back with segment three right after this.